This is the Sony a6400 and the Panasonic G85. Both of these cameras offer a lot for their price value, and in this video, we will be comparing the two and figuring out what is the best camera for you. What's up everybody? I'm Jake McHugh, and this channel is all about making better videos. I do gear reviews and test videos to help you determine what gear you need to make the videos you want to achieve. If that's something that may interest you, consider hitting the subscribe button down below. I decided to create this video because I feel like these are some really great cameras for creating content here on YouTube, and I have some experience using both. I will compare these cameras in 10 different categories, and I will have timestamps down in the description below. I've also made individual reviews or videos on these cameras, so if you want to check those out, make sure you look in the cards or down in the description below. As always, there will also be links down in the description below for every product mentioned throughout this video, and those links will be affiliated, meaning that I will receive a small commission at no extra cost to you. Starting with some specs, the Panasonic G85 has a 16 megapixel micro four thirds sensor, which gives you around a two times crop when shooting photos to be equal to a full frame camera. This camera can shoot up to 4K in 30 frames per second and in 60 frames per second in 1080p with no recording limit in any of these modes. When shooting in 4K, there will be an additional crop to the sensor, making it around a 2.3 or 2.4 times crop, but when shooting in 1080p, it's just the normal or standard two times crop. For example, for this lens on the camera here, which is the Panasonic 14mm f2.5, when shooting photos or in 1080p, it becomes a 28 millimeter full frame equivalent. But when shooting in 4K, it becomes around a 33 millimeter full frame equivalent. Now, is this bigger crop a huge deal? That really depends on what you are shooting and what your needs are, but it's not the end of the world in my opinion. For some specs on the Sony a6400, it has a 24.2 megapixel APS-C size sensor, which gives you around a 1.5 crop compared to full frame cameras. This camera can also shoot up to 4K 30 frames per second, but it also shoots in 1080p up to 120 frames per second. With this camera, there is no additional crop when shooting in 24 frames per second in 4K, but once you go to 30 frames, there's an additional 1.2 times crop. There is no record limit on this camera as well, which is something new for Sony at the time that this camera was released. This camera also has an upgraded processor compared to the model that it replaced, which was the A6300, so overheating is no longer an issue. I usually record about one hour at a time when shooting the talking heads for most of my videos on the channel here, and I've never ran into an overheating issue with this camera, and I've never even had the warning issue pop up as well. With having the slightly bigger sensor compared to the G85, this camera does have less of that crop factor like I mentioned before, and is easier to have a shallower depth of field as well. When it comes to the body size, the A6400 is smaller, but only by eight millimeters in length and height, and it is lighter by 102 grams. While the A6400 is smaller and lighter, more times than not, the lenses will be about the same size, if not smaller, on the G85 with the being micro four thirds. And this is more apparent with the faster zooms. Typically, but not always, having a larger sensor means larger glass, but the kit lens that comes with the A6400 is a great small zoom lens if you're first starting out or you need a more compact setup. The A6400 only has two dials on the top. One is for the shooting modes and the other one is to control your aperture by default, but I actually switched this to control my shutter. There's also this control wheel around the select button on the back side, and this makes it quicker to scroll through settings. On the G85, we have four dials with the far left one being for the different drive modes for shooting photos and for time lapses. On the right side, we have the shooting mode dial. Around the shutter button on the front, there is a dial for your aperture, and on the far right towards the back, there is this dial for your shutter speed. But if you press the button that's on the shutter speed dial, it will then change to your ISO for the back dial and to your white balance settings for the front dial, and this is really handy when shooting on the go. Both of these cameras have function buttons and a custom menu of some sort that you can create or change for your needs, along with a mic jack. For SD card slot on the A6400, you have a single USH-1 on the bottom side of the camera near the battery, and for the G85, you have a single USH-2 slot, which is much more conveniently placed on the outside of the grip for easy access. For the Sony, you have three dedicated custom or function buttons, but all the buttons on the back side of this camera are able to be customized for your needs. By default, you have a quick menu set to a function button on the back, and this is a major key to this camera because it allows you to adjust a lot of settings without having to go into the menu system, but more on this later. The newest feature with this camera is the flip up screen that is touch compatible, but yet in a way is still not completely touch compatible. The touch feature only works with tap to focus or when double tapping the zoom in on a photo and playback mode. This is nice when I'm behind the camera and shooting on sticks, but for run and gun situations or when I have used a gimbal, I've bumped the screen a few times turning this feature on, which causes my focus to be off, 
so just be mindful of this. The flip-up screen is really nice to have and is something that people wanted from Sony for a while on their 4K cameras. Only issue with this design is that if you wanted to add a mic to the hot shoe, it then blocks the flip-up screen, but you can add this relocation bracket made by Small Rig to add the mic to the side of the camera, which is out of the way. Another thing that Sony fixed with its screen compared to its prior models is the ability to turn on sunny weather mode, which brightens up the screen for outside use. And this was a problem in the past when shooting in 4K on on their cameras. On the G85, we have five function buttons on the camera itself, along with a function tab on the flip-out screen, which allows us to have five more function buttons. Just like the A6400, there is a quick menu accessed by default with the function two button, and this allows you to change the settings like picture profile, record quality, and the autofocus settings. Both of these cameras have dedicated ISO buttons, and on the A6400, you can actually change it if you really feel the need to, but on the G85, you also have a button for the white balance, and also for focus settings. But the focus settings button becomes the picture-in-picture -picture mode when in manual focus. There's also a switcher to flip between focusing modes, which is nice because then I don't have to dedicate a function button to go through all the focusing modes like I do with the Sony. I also programmed this button here to do a quick single-shot autofocus to lock on a subject, and this is really handy when shooting on the go in manual focus. There's also a way that you can do this with the Sony, and I will link to a video in the cards and down in the description below that was done by Gerald Undone, and he'll show you how to do so. For the screen on the G85, we have a fully articulating touchscreen. The only issue with this screen is that the mic jack gets in the way and blocks the screen a little bit when using it in a vlogging situation. Other than that, the screen is really amazing for setting focus and going through the menus when using its touch feature. Just like using push button autofocus in manual mode, you can also use the screen to set focus in a hurry. For form function, this is more of a personal opinion, but I tend to lean or give the advantage to the G85 because of its ease of use with the bigger grip and more customization with its function buttons along with the fully articulating touchscreen. Menu systems have have been a knock for Sony cameras in the past, and for the most part, they are the same here. There is a new custom page inside the menu system that you can load up with your most used settings, and when you pair this with the quick menu on a function button, you can, for the most part, avoid having to dig inside the menus. I highly suggest making note of what settings you turn on or off or adjust the most and putting those settings in either of those two spots, and this will help you a lot with this camera. One thing I wish this camera would do, like the G85, is the ability to hold two values for zebras on one function button. For example, on my Panasonic cameras, you can press the function button set for zebras once for the set value, which I usually have around 70 IRE for skin tones, and then you can press it again for a second value, which I have set for 95 IRE for making sure that I don't have anything blown out. This eliminates the need for having to go into the settings and switch between two different values while shooting. The menu system on the G85 is something that I prefer a little bit more, but again, this is a personal thing, and it's all about the verbiage inside the menu and what works best for you. The menus on the G85 are in a cast cascading vertical tab style, and you can use the touch screen to scroll and select features, as well as use the buttons like normal. The menus may look or feel a little older, but this makes sense since the camera has been around longer without any major firmware updates in recent history, but this shouldn't turn you away from this camera at all. For the battery life between the two cameras, the Sony has a slightly smaller battery at around 1020 milliamps compared to 1200 milliamps with the G85, and this is because of the smaller body and grip, but the testing results that I have may surprise you. My Testing was done at 4K and 24 frames per second in manual focus for both cameras. That way it was an even playing field. And I got around a one hour and four minutes of straight recording on the G85 and around one hour and 31 minutes on the A6400 with no overheat warning. You could probably expect to see a little bit shorter life with both of these cameras in autofocus, so make note of that. I thought that the G85 would be better, to be honest, so I was really surprised with these results. And my guess is that with the newer processor in the A6400, it makes shooting in 4K much more efficient compared to the older Sony models, thus not draining the battery as much. While the Sony had the better battery life, there is one other advantage to it, and that's being able to charge over USB power while in use. This allows you to use something like a USB power bank that you might already have for your phone to extend the battery life of your camera as it doesn't necessarily power the camera, but it does help slow down the draining process. You can also power the G85 via a power bank, but this requires a dummy battery and all sorts of rigging, which isn't as convenient compared to the USB power with the Sony. This is something that I do all the time when shooting videos for YouTube as the Sony a6400 is my primary talking head camera, and I find I can easily get around four hours of runtime on a single battery. This is something also to consider with the cost of batteries. Sony batteries tend to cost more than Panasonic ones I find, and you can get a much bigger USB power bank for the same price, if not less than what you can find third-party batteries for this camera. 
giving you more milliamps per dollar. Both of these cameras have a bunch of lenses to choose from, and both kit lenses that come with these cameras aren't really that bad for being a kit lens, especially the one that comes with the G85. Both of these cameras have a short flange distance with being mirrorless, so you have an endless supply of vintage lenses that you can adapt to these cameras, which I love shooting with. If you want to see some vintage lenses that I like, make sure you check out one of my more recent videos on a bunch of lenses that I bought from a local thrift store, and I'll have that linked up in the cards and down in the description below. There is a slight advantage to the G85 when it comes to lens options due to the fact that it has IBIS, which allows you to not have to rely on lenses that have stabilization for shooting handheld. Next, we're going to test the autofocus of these two cameras, and to do so, let's go outside. Alrighty, so we are now in the backyard here, and we're going to be testing the autofocus capability of both of these cameras here. And on the left, we have the Panasonic G85 with the 14 millimeter uh, f2.5 pancake lens, and then on the right, we have the Sony a6400 with the Sigma 16 millimeter f1.4. Both of these lenses are wide open, so the G85 is shooting at f2.5, and the Sony is shooting at f1.4. And you would think technically that the Sony would be at a disadvantage here because it's shooting at much more of a shallower depth of field, but you'll see real quickly on how well you're able to trust the autofocus with this camera. One thing to make note of is that this isn't the most accurate or best representation of the autofocus capabilities for both of these cameras. So we would have to conduct hundreds of different tests and take an average of all those tests just to get a rough idea of how well these cameras are able to autofocus. But this will kind of give us an idea on when we would be able to use autofocus with both of these cameras. So what I'm going to do here is I'm just going to move in and out of frame and we're going to see how well the cameras focus on me and how quick they're able to track me or other subjects in the frame. Alrighty, so while we're outside here, I figured it would be a good time to show you guys what these cameras would look like in a vlogging or handheld situation. And right now you are seeing the footage from the G85, and I have that little pancake lens on once again. And this makes for a really great light setup for vlogging. I love using this setup here for walking around shooting myself like this here. And the only downside with this is that it's not super wide, so right now I'm using my tabletop tripod, and I got it fully extended or almost fully extended. That way it's wide enough so I can fit my whole head in. But I am shooting at f2.5 and I am using the autofocus just so that way you guys can see how well it would work in this situation. This is what it looks like with the 14 millimeter pancake lens. I'm gonna throw the 12 to 35 on next from Panasonic. And we're gonna show you guys what that looks like with it being a little bit wider at 12 millimeters and dual IS. Alrighty, and this is what it looks like with the 12 to 35 f2.8 from Panasonic and like I mentioned this lens has uh, some optical stabilization to it so when you pair it with the IBIS with the camera you get what is called dual IS and this goes for the kit lens that comes with this camera as well and man this is like one of my favorite features with Panasonic cameras uh, dual IS when shooting handheld makes it a breeze and I very rarely have to ever use a gimbal with my Panasonic cameras because of this feature so this is what it looks like here. It's a little bit wider as well. You can also find wider lenses uh, like the 7 to 14 millimeter or another one that I really like is the Tokina 11 to 16 on a speed booster. And that's really fun. <laughs> it's super wide and you don't have to use a tripod at all then. You can just hold the camera and walk around. 
But now we're gonna check out the A6400 in a vlogging situation. And I want you guys to just make note on how shaky this footage is here and then compare it to the Sony. And let me know down in the comments below what you think of the two side by side. Alrighty, and now what you are seeing is the Sony A6400 in a vlogging situation. And this setup here does not have IBIS, nor does it have any lens stabilization with the Sigma, unfortunately. That would be a really awesome setup if it did. But this is what it looks like here. It's probably gonna be a little bit more shaky. Uh, the kit lens that comes with this camera here does have OSS, which is optical steady shot or the lens stabilization that Sony has. But it really doesn't make or break it in my opinion. Uh, if you want to see what that footage looks like, make sure you check out my dedicated review on this camera because I borrowed the kit lens for that video. And then one other lens to consider for vlogging is the 10 to 18 millimeter from Sony. And that is an F4, but it does have steady shot. So you're not able to shoot in crazy low light with that lens, but it will do the job for most situations. And the biggest thing is it's very wide and it has some stabilization to it. So that'll help out a great deal. But what I'm going to do next here is I'm actually going to throw this on a gimbal and show you guys what that looks like. Alrighty, and what you are seeing now is the A6400 on a gimbal. And as you can tell, it is possible to get smooth footage. It just takes a little bit more work or it takes some extra tools to get there. Now, there is pros and cons to every setup out there. Some of the cons to this setup here is that it's, uh, you know, a little bit more heavier. You're going to stand out in public a little bit more if you want to vlog with a gimbal like this. But the pros are is that you're always gonna have stable footage for the most part, and the autofocus is really great. One other thing to make note of with this camera is that the rolling shutter is pretty nasty on this camera compared to the Panasonic. And th that, I think, does play a factor into the shakiness. Uh, the gimbal obviously helps with the rolling shutter too because you won't have quick jerky motions. But when you're shooting handheld, I think that rolling shutter is more apparent. And so that's something also to be mindful of. But let me know down in the comments below if you would actually vlog with a gimbal or would you rather have, let's say for professional work, would you rather have really good IBIS where you don't need a good a gimbal or would you actually rather prefer having a gimbal? And also let me know what you guys think of the autofocus between these two cameras and their color. When it comes to low light, the A6400 is better because of its bigger sensor and Sony tends to be known for its better ISO performance. I find that it can go up to around 6400 ISO before I start noticing noise or color shifts, while on the G85 I notice it much sooner at around 2000 ISO. For image quality, both of these cameras give you a plenty sharp of an image out of camera. Both of these cameras have a 6K size sensor that downscales into a 4K image, and I feel like the Sony is slightly sharper in my test, but this could be because because of the speed booster that I was using on the G85 to adapt the same lens that was used on the A6400. When shooting in 1080p, the A6400 becomes soft and this is much more apparent when you're shooting in 120 frames per second. Both of these cameras shoot in 8 bits so you can only push the colors so much in post, but I feel like you can get away a little bit more with the G85 as it doesn't take much sometimes for the Sony to fall apart. Because of this, it's important to get the look you want as much as possible in camera with your lighting and picture profile settings. Currently, my favorite settings on the A6400 is Sin 2 with the movie color mode, and for the G85, it's the natural picture profile with some settings tweaked inside this profile. But color is a subjective topic in my opinion, so your mileage may vary. Let me know what you guys think down in the comments below about how these cameras compare when it comes to image quality, sharpness, and colors. For miscellaneous specs or other things worth noting, on both of these cameras you get a clean HDMI out through their micro HDMI ports, but there are some drawbacks. Both of these cameras output at 4K 8-bit 422 to an external recorder, so there really isn't much of an upgrade or an advantage when using a recorder with these cameras. When using an external monitor on the G85, you gain an additional crop once again, and with the A6400, you lose face detection autofocus along with the back screen going black once you hit the record button. Having these types of limitations seems to be a common thing to me when it comes to using an external monitor with sub $1,000 cameras, so I don't really see this as a huge issue when comparing this to other options on the market in this price range. One last thing is that the A6400 comes with S-Log2 and 3 along with some HLG profiles so you're able to capture a little bit more dynamic range for video. So what is the best camera for you? Both cameras are great for the money but it really depends on what your needs are in a camera. The A6400 can be had around $900 new for the body only and around $1,000 with the kit lens. The Panasonic G85 can be found with the kit lens brand new for around $700 
$50, but both of these cameras can be had for less on the used market. If you're strictly looking for a photo camera, then I would lean towards the a6400 for sure. If you are someone that shoots video mostly or needs a more hybrid setup, then this is where it gets more difficult or interesting. If you are a solo shooter or content creator shooting on a tripod or other support gear like a gimbal or slider, and you're going to be in front of the camera more often than not, then I would go with the Sony because you really don't need IBIS in that situation, and the autofocus makes life so much easier when you're shooting yourself. If having the ability to shoot in low light is super important to you, then I would again go with the Sony a6400 without a doubt. If you are shooting handheld for the most part and are going to be behind the camera more times than not, then I would lean towards the G85 because of its usability features and IBIS. For vlogging, I would say once again the G85 because of its IBIS, but the thing that's really holding it back from being a great vlogging camera is its autofocus, and this is why I use manual focus mostly with this camera. You could use the A6400 for vlogging, but you would have to rely on very wide lenses with stabilization or a gimbal to help with the shaky footage and the rolling shutter. As for the best bane for your buck, I think again this goes to the G85 as you get some better video features with the IBIS being the biggest one, all at a lower price point. Overall, you really can't go wrong with either one of these cameras. You just have to figure out which one kind of fits your needs the best. So that's going to do it for this one. Thank you so much for watching. If you found this video helpful, make sure you hit that thumbs up button down below and subscribe if you want to see more content like this in the future. And I will catch you guys in the next video. Peace.